Wednesday, May 17th, and this is the Metropolitan Council Committee of the Whole. We're delighted uh, today to have a number of guests in the audience and a number of guest presenters. So we've been looking forward to hearing uh, from our um, uh, Young Leader Collaboration Project. Uh, but uh, you may also question that we often have our Committee of the Whole meetings in a smaller room next door, but because we have such a great series of presenters, uh, we're here in chambers, so welcome. Uh, I'm Charlie Zelli, chair, and uh, we are starting the meeting with our call to order and uh, the agenda, which I just described, is our one item. So unless anybody has an objection, that is the agenda. Uh, but first, we have to approve the minutes from the meeting on May 3rd. So uh, unless there's any corrections or deletions, I would entertain a motion and a second to approve the minutes. So, so moved. Second. Thank you, thank you. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the meeting minutes have been approved. So on to our presentations. And I believe <coughs> kicking it off is uh, Darcy Vandegrift and Gabriela Alvera, is that correct? Um, I think I'll be beginning. My name is Mulkey. But... Is what? Mulkey. Mulkey. And uh, so we're going to jump right into the presentations. I'll just hand it to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Council members. So, as I said, my name is Mulkey Hiley, <coughs> and I'm an intern on the Young Leaders Collaboration. Here with me are my fellow interns, Nikolai Jost Epp and Magali Ruiz Barrios. Also beside me is Sergio Almeida, an intern and presenter who will be keeping time this evening. Uh, each presenter has about 10 to 15 minutes for their portion, so we urge council members to be mindful of this during Q&A. Uh, the Q&A section will, be <laughs> will last around five minutes, so if you have further questions but you're cut off by the timekeeper, feel free to send anyone from the YLCL team an email. Uh, lastly, I would like to recognize the young leaders from the five different organizations in the YLC project that will be presenting shortly. Um, together, we'll be talking about this project as a means for youth engagement for the 2050 Regional Development Guide. Okay. So now that we've gotten started, I'll begin today's presentation by speaking a little bit about <coughs> the philosophy behind the Young Leaders Collaboration Project. Then my colleagues will speak about the design of the workshop process and overview the workshop process as a whole, then speak about how they were conducted, and we'll, we will then begin the presentations from the young leaders. All right. So as some of you know, this project entailed education about the Metropolitan Council and policymaking, to which many of these young people were not aware of how much influence the council had over issues that were relevant to their lives. When giving them the knowledge on policy areas and the council's jurisdiction, it evoked enthusiasm for change in these young leaders. This enthusiasm that we witnessed solidified our belief that what young people seek from government as a whole are opportunities. Opportunities to engage and have their voices heard, as well as opportunities to be leaders and active in their community. So hopefully after today, we will see how needed projects that consider the recommendation of our young people influence our region for the better, as well as empower our young people to be active participants in government processes. Another conversation that I feel must be discussed in a project like this is the value of lived experience. Many of these young people that have participated in this project share commonalities and differences in their life stories and backgrounds. We highlight both to show that their subjective experiences contextualize the statistics that are used to describe their communities. What I've learned being a part of these workshops is that statistics and quantitative data only tell part of the story. There is a quote by Soren Kierkegaard in which he says, truth is subjectivity. His belief was that there was more to the world than objective fact and that the discovery of truths requires subjective human experience as well. It is this truth that is not rationalized, but it is felt. This is all to say that qualitative data produced by the project will give an emotional understanding to the rational and statistical data of the region. We hope that the personal stories shared by these young people today make their truths understood and most importantly, felt. Now, we will transition and talk about the design of these workshops. I give it over to my colleague, Magali. Thank you. 
When designing our curriculums for the workshops, we wanted to make sure we created a community-centered workshop design. It was important to cultivate relationships with young leaders and make sure we met them where they are. Overall, the young leaders completed 20 hours of work, which included attending Met Council workshops, researching the experiences of the youth in the region by interviewing young people. The young leaders were given a stipend aiming to address the barrier of participation. When young people have many responsibilities, including school, work, family, donating uncompensated time is often not an option. Young leaders also took ownership over the project. Our team tried to allow the young leaders to take ownership over the project while also providing guidance. As one of the main purposes of the project was to conduct research and gather community input to inform the process of the regional development guide, we had the young leaders take charge at many steps of the process, including choosing what they wanted to research, developing their own research questions, analyzing their results, summarizing their findings, and creating their own presentations. Adaptation and flexibility. We also aim to be flexible by adapting workshops to the interests, needs of the young leaders. When young people have so much going on in their lives, flexibility was a necessity for a successful community-centered partnership. We also um, held workshops in their spaces. Our team also traveled to meet young leaders where they were based, rather than asking them to come to Met the Met Council locations. Um, given that time and transportation are also one of the barriers to participating in a project like this. We worked around their schedule, scheduling workshops at times that worked best for the organization for the youth, whether that was scheduling workshops um, late evenings or early Saturday mornings. Um, that's when all of our workshops were mostly held. So another piece of meeting people where they were at was addressing language barriers when they arose. Many members of our team are fluent in both English and Spanish, and we developed materials in Spanish and conducted workshop activities bilingually when there was a need. For staff contributing their expertise, our team consulted staff throughout the Met Council working across all five policy areas, and their expertise informed workshop the design of the workshop and engagement process. We sought out advice for things like how to best represent the policy areas and council authorities to the young leaders, what data about regional trends were important to share with the young leaders, and we also consulted with um, council staff about what information they themselves were interested in knowing from young people in the region to inform the research process design. For incorporating uh, feedback and findings into the future workshops, we made space at the end of each workshop for the young leaders to provide feedback, which we implemented in the design of future workshops. Additionally, we centered later workshop activities around the regional issues that the young leaders were most interested in during the introductory workshops. So for example, if um, the young leaders expressed interest in transportation issues or environmental issues, those are the issues we uh, focus the rest of the work, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the workshops around. Um, and then lastly, to, uh, for demonstrating impact, uh, to conclude the final workshop for each organization, we presented on specific ways that the young leaders' contributions would impact the 2050 Regional Development Guide and other areas of council work. This was done for transparency and accountability, and so the young leaders could feel uh, ownership over the impact of the project. So these are just some considerations that our team kept in mind when designing a community-centered engagement process. Next, we will give a bit of an overview of what this process itself looked like, um, and we will do this by giving a summary of each workshop. Um, next slide, please, Magali. Thank you. So uh, the entire engagement process spanned four in-person and two virtual workshops. Um, in the first workshop, the introductory workshop, we began building relationships with the young leaders, introducing them to the region <coughs> as it currently exists, and exploring uh, what the Met Council does. We developed interactive activities to help the young leaders make connections about how their lives are impacted by regional systems and regional planning. We began introducing the language of the Met Council and the language of regional planning to demonstrate how the council understands regional issues and articulates solutions. Um, workshop number two, connecting stories with quantitative data. In this workshop, we connected broad level trends about what's going on at regional, county, or community-wide scale to the personal experience of the young leaders. As Mulkey pointed out earlier, quantitative data and statistics aid in understanding, but to better understand people's lives, we need to complement quantitative data with stories. The series of data visualizations that we brought to each group of young leaders were tailored to their interest. For example, if a group was interested in housing issues, we brought them data about housing cost burdens or housing disparities. 
From there, the leaders prioritized the issues that they wanted to focus on and develop the research questions. The most important part of workshop two was for young leaders to start envisioning the future for the communities through the Met Council lens. Workshop number three, exploring interview results. Um, workshop number three was dedicated um, to spending time identifying and analyzing findings from their data. Um, all together, they collected a total of 121 interviews. Um, and we also spent time identifying measures of a successful region and developing values and visions each organization has for their community. So between workshops three and four, we held uh, two virtual workshops on Zoom or Google Meet. In, the first, in this first virtual workshop, we continued to think about the future we want to see. And to do this, the young leaders began summarizing the findings from their research. These findings included things like uh, the problems young uh, people's communities are facing in the region, how these regional issues impact young people in particular, um, and the solutions that uh, can address these problems. The young leaders started crafting values, visions, and uh, goals for the region. Um, and so in short, in this workshop, uh, we began moving from the problems that the region currently faces to uh, envisioning what the region we want to see looks like and how the council can help get us there. Um, virtual workshop number two, exploring careers at the Met Council. We had career panels with council staff where students were able to explore and learn more about the different <coughs> paths and careers that staff at the council have taken to get them to where they are now. And so lastly, uh, workshop four was our concluding workshop for the uh, Young Leaders Collaboration Project. In this workshop, with all the results in hand, so all of the qualitative data from the interview research and from the previous workshops, the Young Leaders began developing their presentations, and our team provided guidance by encouraging the Young Leaders to think about what qualitative and quantitative data would best support their findings um, and what findings they wanted to prioritize in their presentations. While the Young Leaders did all the research work and produced all the findings, our team guided by helping with the development of the presentations and communicating the results in an evidence-based way. Um, so our conclusion, so that is an overview of the philosophy behind this project and an overview of our engagement process. We hope that the Met Council will continue to recognize the value of youth experience, knowledge, and expertise, and hope that this project is not the end, but just the beginning of youth engagement at the Met Council. Next, you will hear from the representatives from all five groups of young leaders, 4-H, World Youth Connect, the Environmental Stewardship Institute from Friends of the Mississippi River, Raices Latinas, and Esperanza United. We will pass it over to the speakers from 4-H. Thank you. Should we have... So uh, before we pass it over to 4-H, um, we have a few minutes for questions. We have time for questions. Yes. Great. Um, uh, can I just ask the quick question? That's the chair's prerogative. On the career data, did anybody express an interest in working for Met Council? <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a lot of interest yes. for a lot of different careers. Um, I think a lot of the young leaders, they could speak for themselves, but they were really um, amazed at all the diverse career paths that mm -hmm. um, reside here, so yeah. yeah. Thank you, Chair and Council Can we have a couple of questions? Chai? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just two quick comments. Um, I was really excited when Darcy reached out to me and, and in the early stages of planning this whole project, I really uh, appreciated the fact that we gave young people stipends. When we are as governments, we go out into the communities. Um, if we, if we don't value people's time and their wisdom and experience, their lived experience, uh, it seems like an extractive relationship. And so I appreciate the staff for, for doing that. <coughs> and also, um, in, in another life, I used to run the uh, internship program for St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman. And so I appreciate the energy and the passion that you young people bring to the table. And, and I'm really glad that we were doing this program. And uh, five years ago, at the age of 31, I was appointed to sit up here. And I expect that in you know, 10, 15 years, I, at least 17 of you will be sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair. Oh, Tony. Thank ahead. you. I, this isn't going to be long, but I have to say I'm so, so proud in this moment to see you here and thank you all so much for being here, everyone. And can I take pictures? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No other questions. Well, thank you so very much. Wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
Welcome. Good evening, Chair and Council Members. My name is Ava Kale, and I'm joined with Mia Van Vorst and Lex Parks. We are representing the communities of Shockby, Prior Lake, and New Prague. And what we're doing here today is exploring our future through housing and safety. And we want to highlight the words conservation, accessibility, improvement, safety, and recreation. So the presentation team, like I already mentioned, consists of me, Ava, Mia, Lex, and Kingston and Owen are supporting us from the audience. They helped us make this presentation. So the purpose of what we're here today to do is we believe in affordable housing, preservation of open land, pedestrian safety, accessibility of our cities, and overall creating a brighter future and a healthy community for us young people. This slide is a dive deeper into 4-H as that's who we're partnering with today. 4-H is an out-of-school hands-on learning program where we connect with caring adults and our peers on things that we're interested in to really dive deeper and have opportunities like this. And it's really just where we find what we love to do and what we're interested in. Our focus of this presentation here today is on the two priorities of balancing open space and farmland with the need for affordable housing, as well as the safety of pedestrians in walkable cities. We chose these issues because we think they are essential problems where solutions need to be had. We conducted various amounts of research through interviews and group discussions and found data to support the importance of land use and conservation, as well as pedestrian safety throughout the regions. Like I said before, the methods, we had various methods, but we did interviews consisting of people 14 through 18 within the seven counties, primarily Scott, as well as researching different housing types, housing inequality, and having group discussions on the importance of sidewalk safety and how we can improve it. That brings me on to our first issue, which is our housing, and that is Mia. <clears throat> Our first issue is balancing open space and the need for housing. We as young people feel that we won't be able to find good housing when we are adults because all the land is unhealthy and housing is not affordable. Most housing we see today is cookie cutter, meaning all the houses look the exact same and are not an efficient use of land. Making urban areas more dense instead of spreading out over unused land could help improve this, as well as building multifamily homes. Having multifamily homes also makes them more affordable and an achievable goal. We need houses, however. We also need open space for our physical and mental health. It is important to have clean, open land. We need to be in nature to be healthy. We need the sun, clean air, and land. This open land allows people to experience the healthy outdoors. Okay, open land, open and clean land is necessary for physical and mental health. So we envision our region to have clean, healthy land. Our community cleans and protects the land. Our housing is affordable to all communities. A clean land environment is one that is free from pollution and contamination. It is important to have a clean land environment because it is essential for human health and well-being. A clean land environment also helps protect wildlife and ecosystems. There are many ways to help keep our land and environment clean. We can recycle, reduce our waste, and use less energy. We can also support businesses and organizations that are working to protect the environment. It is important to remember that we all have a role to play in keeping our land and environment clean. By working together, we can make a difference. We have experiences from our communities and our leaders to highlight this. One of our interviewees stated, my parents grew up in the country. They had a chance to explore and be kids. Now we have a third of an acre. We don't have a chance to explore. We can see the impact this has had on you today as more people defer to staying indoors as they feel all their freedom and space to explore has been taken away by construction. Another youth member of our community said, Housing and how we use the land are important to young people as we will be the ones living with the outcome. Once the land is gone, there's an reverse. This is especially prominent as more land is being used in unhealthy ways. There's no reverse to this and young people will have to live with the consequences of used unhealthy land. One personal example I have of this relates to the two pictures on the slide. The one on the top is a beautiful waterfall that my family would often walk to see. However, a few years, construction started upstream and now, as shown on the bottom of the picture, there is no water in our waterfall. Too much construction affects our land in unhealthy, irreversible ways. I'm now passing this on to my colleague, Lex. 
So our issue two was pedestrian safety. <clears throat> Sidewalks are important because they provide a designated spot for pedestrians to walk on. This helps keep pedestrians safe from traffic and other hazards. In our 28 interviews, 78 described how the lack of sidewalks makes them feel unsafe and even described as scary when exposed to traffic. The safety of everyone in the region is important, and which is why we want to highlight our concerns for children and people with special needs. Adding and improving this infrastructure is important to many things. As our research highlighted, recreation and transportation are the most common uses of sidewalks. This is important to us as a youth because we want to see our neighborhoods and towns become safer and more accessible. Here is the different research done on our interviews where we got our vision statement from. For example, in one of our inf interviews, one of them quotes, I got hit by a car crossing the road and the car didn't even stop to see if I was all right. This is a problem because no one should feel able to experience this type of treatment when crossing the road and should be able to feel safe knowing that crosswalks let other vehicles know when to stop for pedestrians. Our vision statement is that we want our region to feel safe, walkable, and accessible. What we found is that while some places do fit this vision, there's a lot more room for improvements and additions for maximized safety. We prioritize the safety of people and want to reduce the number of accidents within drivers or pedestrians making sidewalks more available in busy streets. And our vision for housing is building a wide range of housing to fit different family needs, making sure the types of housing built is affordable for the people that will be buying them and to make sure that open space is kept with wide space for outdoor activities while maintaining animal habitats. That was, sorry for that. Our goal for pedestrian safety would be that all communities in the region are to have adequate pedestrian and bike infrastructures to keep people safe. This includes building wider sidewalks, installing safety features at intersections, and building sidewalks and crosswalks and still in busy locations. And the goal for housing would be for all people to have access to housing that fits them and their family's needs, to maintain open land for animals and people's benefits. The affordability of housing is essential for people's physical and mental wealth, and it's important to balance that with the need for open land while it still preserves animals' habitats and recreation. This would include building a wide range of housing to fit different families' needs, making sure the types of housing is, built is affordable for the people that will be buying them, and making sure that open space is kept to the ability with space to do outdoor activities while still maintaining animal habitats. And with that, we would like to say thank you. And with some of these are photos from different people who were a part and put a lot of work into it. And we are now open for questioning. <coughs> Robert. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks for, to you and to your team for your work and for your presentation. It's just, it's wonderful data. And, and I'm really impressed with the number of uh, uh, interviews you were able to hold and a number of surveys. And it's just such a good way of gathering uh, that kind of specific data from people, but it's often hard. It's labor intensive, right? It takes a lot of time. You have to locate the uh, survey subjects. And so I'm just wondering how you identified the people that uh, you applied the survey tool to. So we each interviewed three people. <clears throat> And these were people between, we had an age limit, 14 through 18, and we just said, make sure they live within our seven counties or seven regions. And from there, we had our own freedom to choose who we wanted. So I think in total, it was like 28 interviews, and we got a wide variety of people. Cool, thanks. And then I would just note that, especially in the pedestrian safety area, and there's just been a huge interest at the state level, regional level, local level, around eliminating pedestrian Deaths, and so one of the things also is sort of that you have to change your culture, right? So there's a an education component there too, and so I look to look forward to see how your work here here supports that. And I just want to note that I am a 4-H graduate, and, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> nine years of 4-H. So it's great to see. I got to do a lot of cool stuff in 4-H, but nothing this quite this cool. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Deb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
First of all, as the representative who represents most of Scott County, welcome and thank you so much for being here. This was fantastic. I think you highlight a thing that in our communities we really struggle with and really it's the push and pull with open space and farmland and the need to maintain some of that ag land, um, but also build housing and affordable housing and make those communities accessible. So I think what you've brought to us was very, very important and really helpful and I really appreciate you taking the time to do all of that. And um, like my fellow council member, I also so I'm a 4-H alumni, so I look at this and I go, to me, 4-H um, is really about leadership, investigating, learning, how do you present. Um, I learned how to present in 4-H, that's how I... Uh, learn these skills. I learned how to run a meeting in 4-H. There are a lot of things that these skills that you can bring that will take you through your life. So just super proud of all of you. So thank you. Any other questions? I was thinking of the people I know who are 4-H'ers <laughs> who are in leadership positions, more than just the two of you. And so that's a, we'll expect that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? I think you drew on, upon your own life experiences too when I was seeking your posters. It, it's not just the interviews, I think, <coughs> and particularly the pedestrian uh, biking space. That's, uh, as mm -hmm. Councilmember Lilligren said, we, we hear that a lot around the state, but uh, uh, youth vision has been important too. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Council Members. My name is Gracia, and this is my partner, Zaida, and we are uh, coming from Raices Latinas. Over here, we have Vistos en la Comunidad, which means in Spanish, seen in the community. And we can sort of see the relevance of that coming up. Hi, good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. My name is Zaida Cardoso. Uh, we are both participants with Raices Latinas. Essentially, what Raices Latinas is a program that helps um, Spanish speakers to be able to access resources, to have tools, you know, because sometimes it's not very accessible. Um, and it might be the language barrier, you know, sometimes we're just not informed. So Raices Latinas is the primary example of why we're here today, because we were able to get the opportunity to be here and to speak about our community and representing <coughs> Nuestra Comunidad Latina. So we are representing uh, the Richfield and Bloomington area, so Hennepin County. Uh, today we will be talking about issues and data sources, as well as uh, the issues that we want to talk about, which is housing affordability, uh, community belonging, and then we will talk about the reflection and recommendations and goals. So for uh, the issues that we decided to tackle were housing affordability, which resonates with a lot of people <coughs> of color, and uh, housing is a base. It's, it's, it's a foundation. It's kind of where we are able to grow. It's kind of difficult to grow without a solid kind of grounded foundation to be in. And also safety, the communities that we are in and the environment we have around us really does affect what we are able to kind of assess and look at in our lives and what we are able to focus on, as well as community belonging, uh, authenticity, growth, and safety. Do we feel in touch with each other? Do we feel like we are able to connect with each other through different barriers that we have? And we saw how that impacted our community or even just the lack thereof might impact our community as well. So for our data sources, we used specific interview questions. And for those interview questions, we, we thought about the purpose of, of what we wanted to get from those 
questions. Like what we wanted to encourage people to tell their story. We wanted them to really go in depth to hear that question and really feel kind of what they what they were saying. And for those interview questions we had, how did your parents or guardians' housing choices affect your housing plans? Because a lot of us are products of our environment and it takes a lot to heal from that as well as, you know, kind of that foundational base, as well as what do you need to feel seen in the community? What do you need to feel comfortable? Um, and for the interview participants, we had 18 Latino community members from the ages 14 to 24. And one of the preferences we had is that they lived in the areas of Bloomington, Richfield, and South Minneapolis. So for the first issue, we had housing affordability. And one thing that we really wanted to touch on is what is comfortable living? When we talk about you know, being comfortable with kind of our living, uh, we think about like what makes us feel at home, settled in our communities. And I think one thing that we really wanted to tackle on with affordability is kind of how much freedom we have to focus on the things outside of work and outside of just the bare minimum of, of needing to survive. So do we work to live or do we live to work is something that I really thought of. And uh, it kind of leads into sort of the idea of survival mode. So we have this idea of like self-preservation that I feel would really, our communities could really benefit from kind of developing. I mean, a lot of our families, given the jobs that they have to work to even just be able to afford rent or housing, uh, in general, pay like pay for their house or groceries and such, to really always be in that place of kind of instability or feeling unsure could really affect your ability to be present and show up in your community and show up for your family, uh, especially if you have kids. How do they feel responsible to fill in? Do they feel like they have to be responsible to fill into the household? Do, are they able to focus on the things like school and such? Um, we have this idea of like housing permanence as well. I feel like a lot of our communities we found were being phased out of their homes. My family lived in Richfield for a while and unfortunately we had to move to other places because we were being phased out by the rent increases and it was a really heartbreaking thing because Richfield was such a nurturing place for uh, my family being part of the Latino community. Um, we also think about the access to basic needs, you know, equitable kind of resources and uh, kind of what we feel we can really accomplish in our lives. I mean, when we get home, we, we often think about, you know, is, can you really focus on are my kids doing all right? Uh, do my neighbors need any help with anything? It, it, you kind of feel like you have to keep to yourself to self-preserve when... Uh, and kind of interacting with the rest of your community doesn't always come to mind because you're so focused on even just staying in that community or to be able to provide for your home. It, it kind of lacks, it's more difficult to connect when you're in a place of survival mode and on a consistent basis. Um, we wanted to also hum uh, humanize the issue. So these are some of the quotes that we had from the interviews that we made. Uh, and often the people that we interviewed were part of that community and we were really close with that or just people that we knew that kind of knew each other. Uh, so one of the quotes is, immigrant families are getting faced to outer suburbs. Uh, BIPOC are the ones that most use the transit systems, but we're getting phased out of cities that have access to transit systems. However, it is interesting that Minnesota just passed driver's licenses for all, regardless of immigration status. So that is a sort of example of somebody feeling really seen because they saw that there was a struggle about the fact that, hey, we aren't allowed to get around without feeling constantly scared about being pulled over, or but we still have to work. You still have to provide. You still have to show up. And the fact that Minnesota passed driver's licenses for all made us see, feel seen as a community. Like this problem in my life is actually being addressed and the policies are kind of fitting my needs as, as a person from the community. I feel seen, I feel cared for, and I feel taken care of. Another one is the Met Council should come down with the community and talk about it. With wages, most people aren't able to pay because their salaries aren't high enough. So they're working two to three jobs, which again connects to 
like they don't have time to like connect as much, as well with each other. I feel like the the they seek to be seeked out by the Met Council. It's not just about kind of here's the resources. It's about hey, we want to know that you actually care about our individual situations and our our community rather than just kind of being like this is something that we assume is going to help you. And as for like a personal story, uh, kind of like a personal story I have, we didn't really, my family growing up, although we still managed to stay in the Bloomington, South Minneapolis, Richfield area, and I managed to go to school to Edina due to school choice, I saw the different resources of the different places that we lived in because we were constantly having to move all the time. And I grew up really isolated without friends because it was hard. I always had to move. Uh, and if not that, my parents were always working multiple jobs. So I had to stay at home and be a second or a third parent. I had to basically not be able to focus as much on school, try like around two times harder to sort of manage the sort of things that people would consider baseline in Edina. For someone in my situation that was living in a small apartment, it was really difficult to be able to feel like enough in a community that really did have a lot more resources than the places I lived in. To start off with the second issue, I wanna start off with a quote. It says, we're taught that culture is something to be assimilated, but we need to teach that cultural diversity is a benefit to all communities rather than a burden and a division. So on long hand with what Grecia was saying, um, we do believe that community belonging goes hand in hand with housing affordability. Uh, the reason being is because we see cultural diversity. When we have that luck, the, the lack of community, we don't really feel, seed, feel seen or safe within our community by itself. We automatically feel isolated. Um, cultural, cultural diversity is needed for all communities to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. And representation matters. Uh, it opens the door for all of us to be seen and to know that we matter in general. You know, being here today is a representation of what we're seeking for. And so it just allows the expression of culture. Personal stories are, you know, examples of what needs to be heard because sometimes they're not, can't really ident identify yourself with it because you're not primarily living it. You know, so it's really important to be able to have representation um, to, be, to be seen. And in a workshop that we had a couple weeks ago, Grecia said something about sometimes it's not about if you want, it's I want you here. You know, so it's being seeked out as well, um, where we want, to be, we want to feel seen and we want to feel like we actually belong within our community. Alongside with uh, some quotes that we got from the interviews that we got was, in order to feel seen in my community, it's important to feel like I belong and I'm a part of my community. I need physical and emotional safety, which allows me to be myself. Being my authentic self has a great influence on my ability to find a sense of belonging, as well as acknowledging the desire, of, desire to belong and feel included. And then the second one is, I want my community to recognize all individuals and groups of people, which means putting an effort to communicate and gather people together. To me, that would, be, that would show that every single individual insights and, particu and participation matters and means something. Uh, a personal story that I have for that is, sometimes when our parents feel isolated, we automatically get isolated because that's all that we know. So sometimes seeking out can be really difficult for us um, simply because we weren't really introduced to that as kids, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She's my um, But yeah, I just think that it's really important for all of us to feel like we belong so that we can become a part of the community rather than, you know, a division and creating, um, you know, that, that gap. I think that we all can benefit from each other. And it's shown because we live in the United States. So. Uh, for our vision statements, so we want our community to feel empowered to educate each other, especially our children and young people. 
Uh, we want our members of the community to be open and to be respectful of each other's backgrounds and our region to have stable and intercon interconnected community that supports all members. So for some of the recommendations we have are to prioritize public spaces, green open spaces, increased place uh, making strategies and dedicated to have spaces just dedicated to cultural representation. We also wanted to have increase of mixed use development centers and more affordable housing options and housing types. I mean, if, you, if we can't have for the moment, it, I mean, affordable housing might take time, but to just have a place that feels like a second home where you feel like you could come to a community that's going to make it also feel like home, that has significant value. I mean, mixed-use centers to have classes for preparation or to just be able to see a familiar face in a time where even if you don't want to talk or reach out, you'd still feel supported. And so we have a few goals that we have for the region, which is the that the region's residents have access to affordable housing. Again, that could be more like long-term as well. And we also have that, we have included spaces for the community, development of programs. I mean, that in itself helps the community feel seen. Like, hey, we see that your community a lot or the demographic that is present in this region uh, might be able to use more like prep resources, alternates to like college resources, like maybe prep school, things like that, or even just a place where you can go and think, say, hey, this is something I'm going through. This is something that I need. Can I, is there something here for me? And as well as for children to live in affordable housing and supportive communities so they can focus on kind of bettering and breaking from those cycles we have of living on survival mode or feeling like we have to work like three jobs to be able to survive. So I think that it's very important for the future to, you know, nurture that or allow the future to grow. and questions. Any council members? John. Yeah. I'm um, council member John Pacheco, and actually I'm president of the Latino Chamber of Commerce, and so I've heard the, the, um, the stories you've told. I've worked with the community. I had the privilege of testifying before the legislature on driver's license for all. So I do appreciate you coming out here today, and it's always great for us to, to hear, especially younger voices, uh, and so thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Carter. Yeah, I just want to say muchas gracias. Great presentation. Um, you know, the, the idea of affordable housing, it's very important to me personally because I grew up uh, in a very poor neighborhood and, and my, uh, my parents had to uh, work really hard to just get the basics for us. And so what happens... Uh, is a lot of their income, as you stated, was devoted to maintaining housing. Whereas if they had more, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, then they have more time to give to the kids. They have more time, more income to spend on other things that are just gonna enrich the lives of the children. So uh, thank you for pointing out the, uh, what should be the obvious to many people. And uh, thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, Wendy. There you <laughs> are. You there you are. See way down at this <laughs> end of the table. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I so you're you're talking about not feeling seen or not feeling like you, you belong sort of resonated with me. I think every teenager feels like they don't belong. I, I, I mean, maybe I'm getting a little too personal, but but uh, being a teenager is really, really hard, and I'm glad I never have to do it again. But um, so my my husband is from Thailand. He's mixed race, and he came to the Minnesota when he was 10 and ended up in Albert Lee. And everybody in his class was blonde hair and blue eyes, and he was not. And he felt really self-conscious about that. Like, I don't, you know, I don't match here, and he felt bad. But... Several years ago, we went to a 
uh, class reunion and he was talking to some of his old classmates and he found out that all of those people he was intimidated, the girls thought he was really hot. <laughs> <laughs> Realize what he had to offer. So don't sell yourself short is basically what mm -hmm. I'm saying because just because you feel like maybe you don't belong doesn't mean that people are looking at you that way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the presentation. Thanks for the work. And really thanks for sharing the personal stories. And, and I think this is really elevates for us. You know, we sit here, we make policy. There's, you know, we're grappling with almost unsolvable problems. And, and I think what really the sense of community that you're describing, the belonging piece, I think that's really important that we are acknowledging that in our work here. And it, it isn't always the easy thing. You can take sort of a really narrow approach as you're developing <coughs> policy, or you can take a more expansive approach that acknowledges that we're not just talking about housing people can afford to live in, but we're talking about community, places where people feel welcome and belonging. And I just think that's important for us to, to acknowledge. So thanks. Sue. I'm, I'm not sure if she's your daughter or not. But Adorable. It, she is darling, and I want to thank you for bringing her. And it's a reminder to all of us that this is why we're here. And I hope that in about 10, 15 years, she's back working on a panel for this, this great collaborative. It's terrific. Thank, thank you. you. She's very well behaved. <laughs> Maybe Thank you. There's true. there's a lot of shushing happening around <laughs> here, but we're making it work, so thank you. <laughs> Reva? Oh, thank you, Chair. And yes, um, I really like the fact that this is a, a multi-generational <coughs> approach to um, policy making. And um, I was just really intrigued by the beginning of the presentation. Um, Raices Latinas, I don't know if I said that right, but being seen in community and what that really means in terms of inclusion, in terms of meaning that we take a moment to think about who haven't we reached out to. I heard that several times in the presentation. Um, when we recognize we're allowing people to be seen in community, when we celebrate the differences and make people feel welcome, then we're being seen. Yeah, we've had our first time hack, so if we just, maybe in the next community. few sentences, we get the next group percent. Oh. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> I'm the ruthless timekeeper. You are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Uh, greetings, Chair and Council members. Uh, we are from the Friends of the Mississippi Rivers Environmental Stewardship Youth Council, uh, and we are presenting on park access and habitat conservation. Uh, my name is Rhea Stebbleton. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I live in St. Paul. Uh, one thing that kind of led me to be interested in this project is my passion for environmental issues and environmental justice, um, and I also really enjoy uh, working with other youth with similar passions regarding our future. And I'll pass it on to my colleague, Ivy. All right. Hello, Chair and Council members. My name is Ivy Song, and I use she, her pronouns. I live in Roseville. I have always been interested in climate issues and the climate situation we are in, especially after taking AP Environmental Science at my high school. Um, I had always had interest in it, but wasn't sure how to change anything or what I can do myself. So finding ESI was really helpful for me and I get to help change our future one step at a time. And the contents we will be presenting on today, so we'll start with about us, more about our council, and then we'll dive into our first issue, which is park access and connections, and our second issue, habitat conservation and community gardens. So a little bit about us. Environmental Stewardship Institute Youth Advisory Council is a group of high school students working towards environmental education and equity through community engagement. 
Young people gain leadership skills and learn about important environmental and equity issues. Some of our group values include accessibility, climate education, environmental justice, biodiversity, indigenous knowledge, and youth empowerment. For this project, we worked with the Met Council to interview residents of the Met Council region. We asked them for their experiences with park access and habitat conservation and how those things impacted their experience with their community. We took those stories and combined them with our own experiences to outline those two issues and create goals and visions for the future. So our first issue is park access and connection. So first, accessibility is the practice of making information, activities, and or environments sensible, meaningful, and useful for as many people as possible. Diving into park accessibility is affected by pollution in the parks, whether in the water, air, or on land. It deters people from going to parks. People don't want to be in places where it's dirty, so keeping parks clean is essential for more people to visit parks. Pollution in water looks like algae blooms, dead fish, and litter. Litter also accumulates on land and can be a big problem. Air pollution comes from being too close to big roadways or factories, which both produce carbon monoxide and is harmful to people. Poor transportation is another issue for people. In our interviews, we found that people who bike or walk feel that the roads aren't safe. Cars don't know what to do when there's a biker around and there are dangerous roads and intersections for people, for cyclists and pedestrians to reach regional parks. A stoplight at a busy intersection would help as well as having designated lanes and having drivers be aware of them. So increasing education and awareness. There is also little public transit to parks and if people don't feel safe biking or walking or it's too far from them to do so, they won't go. Young people are also the least likely to visit and are the ones who don't have cars to drive, so public transit is more important for them. As one of our interviewees said, we need more parks and trees and public transit close to where people live. All of these are issues, all of these issues are connected and it is important to take a holistic view when planning park locations. Another issue is lack of awareness. If, they don't, if people don't know what is in parks or the benefits of going to parks, they are less likely to go. The last accessibility concern we have is safety. Around visiting parks, as mentioned before, with the transportation and busy intersections, getting to parks raises safety concerns, but when they do arrive in parks, they are also safety concerns there. When people hear about accidents and others being robbed at parks, they tend to avoid them for a while. So what is the connection to regional policy? Um, throughout our interviews and research with young people from multiple counties, um, we kind of came to the conclusion that park accessibility is drastically different for everyone, and a lot of it depends on their age, race, and ability. Um, so we want to prioritize a focus on aspects of the system that create the greatest barriers um, to access for young, elderly, disabled, and BIPOC residents. Um, areas with mostly BIPOC residents often have a history of being valued lower and not being invested in with parks and public spaces. So if you think of like the history of racial covenants and redlining, especially in Minnesota, it disproportionately affects communities of color and their access to these parks. Um, tying back to what Ivy mentioned about pollution, in order to make these parks enjoyable and accessible for all, there needs to be more operation and maintenance funding in order to combat issues of pollution and litter. Uh, clean outdoor spaces encourage people to come to parks for recreation and education. Uh, a clean park makes people feel safe and pollution litter makes people feel like a park is poorly maintained um, and it's not a safe place to be. So how does this affect my community? Parks are a place of gathering and if a certain demographic can't get to parks, especially the elderly and those with disabilities, then not everyone can gather and have a place of community. The excluded groups will miss out on the benefits that parks provide. In many of our interviews, people have said that parks are a place of gathering where they have met new people and built deeper connections to those in their communities. Another effect is to get away from technology. We all know that people nowadays are glued to their technology and being at parks is a good way to get away from them. Being outdoors brings people a lot of benefits, including for mental and physical health, as well as social development. It has been proven in many research studies that teenagers and young people suffer from mental illnesses at greater rates than any other age group. 
It has also been proven that being outside and getting exercise helps improve mental health, so having parks be accessible to everyone is extremely important. And why is this an issue for young people specifically? Parks are one of the few places that young people can spend time with friends, family, and other loved ones without having to spend money. Young people do not have much money, so having a place that is free and good for them is important. Parks are a place that can provide environmental education. This is important because in order to solve an issue, the first step is education. When more people learn about the environment at parks, they are equipped to address and combat climate change, which protects our green spaces into the future. This ties into our group values of climate education and youth empowerment. As we have mentioned earlier, the outdoors is a great resource to improve mental health. This was seen especially during the pandemic when people couldn't meet indoors. Taking walks at parks with family and friends was and still is a great way to connect. A quote from one of our interviews is, parks and outdoor recreation spaces are important to de-stress, build communities, and make friendships bloom. Those in our interview saw the positive effects of being outdoors. So some of our visions for safety are parks are safe for everyone, regardless of age, gender, race, or ability. Um, safety and equality are priorities for parks in this region. Um, and one of our main goals is that animals and plants are healthy in our region, free of the effects of pollution and litter. Um, and for our visions for education, uh, every school has a field trip to a regional park once a year. We think this would be a really beneficial way for all students to have access to environmental education. Um, our region's children and youth have knowledge of native plants, animals, and biodiversity through public education in regional parks. Um, as Ivy was saying, it's important that our future generation knows the risks of uh, climate change and the negative impacts on our environment. Um, young people's passion and care for parks grows from environmental education, resulting in better protection and accessibility of green spaces. And we encourage youth to utilize and benefit from regional parks by providing inclusive programming that meets everyone's needs. So moving on to our second issue, habitat conservation and community gardens. So cities and residents are disconnected from the habitat around them. Community gardens are a great source of education, but help get, it can also help build cultural meaning as they bring their neighborhood together. Community gardens help provide food secure neighborhoods. So our connection to regional policy. Um, Communities can plan for how they will protect native habitats and create community garden space through comprehensive plans, um, really uh, allowing for community involvement. Um, and support for native habitat as a part of operations and maintenance funding for regional parks and trails would also help to benefit um, community connection to nature. Uh, also spaces for community gardens and habitat Conservation should be important elements of comprehensive plans from local governments. Um, it's also important to have continued support for expanding in nature-based parks. Uh, proposed transit and environmental services constructions should consider how to preserve and restore habitat and create spaces for community gardens, um, especially going into the future. So how does this affect uh, my community? Uh, community gardens have a lot of benefits, um, including creating food secure communities. So affordability, accessibility, nutritious food, and it's community made. Um, community gardens also aim to reduce social isolation and increase community cohesion. Um, and oftentimes communities are isolated and there isn't enough sp uh, space to connect and be together. Uh, one thing that came up in our interviews a lot were people started to really value parks during the pandemic uh, as that was the only place that they could see their families and friends. Um, so parks and green spaces are the places where communities can get involved and work together. Um, native habitat in parks and across the region will also protect species living here and create a more resilient future. So why is this an issue for young people? 
Parks are a place that everyone can go, so having habitat conservation and community gardens are not only beneficial to the ecosystem, but also to the people in the community. Educational lessons can be taught about both the native plants and animals and how to garden. Community gardens and being at parks benefits mental health, and with having the gardens, we can teach people how to garden and pass on that knowledge. Um, so here are our visions for habitat and community gardens. Um, we hope our region cities have abundant tree canopy, gr green space, natural habitat, and community gardens. Uh, our region builds additional homes with concern for preserving natural ha native habitat. Um, our region supports biodiversity in every neighborhood. Uh, throughout the region, humans can connect with nature by having local parks with many elements of nature in them. Um, some of our goals include our region is a national leader for coexistence between human and non-human species. Uh, native habitat conservation and community gardens exist in every neighborhood. Uh, communities invest in planting events and provide residents access to learning about growing food and preserving native habitat, kind of connecting to some of our points about education. Uh, and native plants and trees grow near every transit station and stop in the region. So all of these kind of statements are what we as youth hope to see in the future for our environment and our park systems. Um, thank you chair and council members for listening to our presentation. We appreciate your time and we'll open it up for questions. Council Member Vento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had to get my hand up really quick because I wanted to be the first to comment. I, <laughs> a, after I leave here this evening, I'll be virtually attending the board meeting of the Friends of the Mississippi. Um, I've been proud to be a board member with the Friends for 12 years. And I wanted to note that this is the 30th year of the Friends. The Friends were founded by a group of visionary people, including the incredible environmental leader in our state that too few people know about, a man by the name of Peter Gove. Peter worked at the state level with our late Governor Wendell Anderson. He was the first leader of the Environmental Quality Board, went on to work in Washington uh, for the National Park Service. He was their head of legislative affairs, came back to Minnesota, worked in, in the private sector, but always kept both feet firmly planted in the environmental realm. And um, Peter's going to be honored in a few weeks by the friends. But I, I think that having young people here tonight to present is just such a perfect um, exclamation point for Peter's service because mm -hmm. he's always been committed to, along with the rest of the Friends of the Mississippi River, committed to building future environmental activist, activists, mm -hmm. advocates. So thank you very, very much. Um, I, I love these presentations, all of them, but this one really kind of tugs at the heart. So thank you. You did a great job. Thank you so much. And if you're going to be at the board meeting, you might see this presentation for a second time in the row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we will also be there. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Gonna... All right, Councilmember Lee. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, this is a very, uh, all these presentations are great, and this one is very uh, time timely in particular. Earlier this year, uh, earlier this month, um, the Surgeon General announced that uh, one of the silent pandemics <coughs> and then heightened uh, during the COVID pandemic was uh, the pandemic of, of loneliness uh, and social isolation, which is an increasing problem in our society because uh, uh, as we get older, a lot of folks don't make a lot of friends or maintain relationships. And the science shows that that affects people's mental and physical health. And so one of the, uh, the Biden administration is rolling out a framework to help combat um, social isolation. And the very first tenet of the framework is improving and maintaining public spaces such as parks and public libraries. Mm -hmm. So this is a very uh, a timely presentation for us as we consider the 2050 plan. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, Councilmember Lindstrom. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm really just curious to know, we have, I think, 56 regional parks. Mm -hmm. Which ones are your favorites, mm -hmm. number one? Uh, or which lakes or rivers? I know you have to say the Mississippi, but yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe there are others that are some of your favorites. And do you think our parks are doing a good job right now? I know there's always opportunities to improve on the items that you um, outlined. And the last thing I'll say is that I had a role to play in developing our community garden. 
um, in my little city, and you are so right. You have no idea how right you are uh, of just about what a community building activity that can be. I'd be out there weeding, and inevitably somebody would come up to me that I don't know and just be like, what's going on here? What is this place? Oh, and then you find out that your you know, neighbors uh, a block down. Oh, my name's so-and-so, oh, and, you know, nice to meet you. And so just kudos. Uh, I think your whole presentation was just right on the money. Thank you. And my parks question from the outset. What <laughs> is your favorite parks or, or waterways? Um, you can start, Ivy. Right. So I live in Roseville, and St. Paul is right like on the border of where I live. My favorite park to go to is Como Park. Mm -hmm. I love just the zoos and all the plants there. It's really fun to look at. Um, well, with the Environmental Stewardship Institute, one of our kind of things that we did last year was we hosted all of our meetings uh, outdoors at different regional parks uh, due to COVID. And I discovered so many parks that I didn't even know really existed in our community. Um, one that I really enjoyed was Crosby Regional Park. Um, it's so beautiful there. And we also like get to be right down by the river. So that was really enjoyable. Um, and it, when it comes to how our parks are right now, I think it really depends. Um, as Ivy was talking about Como Park, uh, my school is right by there. And parts of it are really dirty and could use a lot of work, even though it is still very beautiful to be around. But I think there's 100% room for improvement when it comes to the cleanliness of parks and the accessibility to them. You get stars for your diplomacy. <laughs> <laughs> We're all learning. <laughs> Any other quick questions? It's actually all our time for questions. That's all the time. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Welcome. Thank you. Chair, council members, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us today to hear on two important issues we spent extensive research on. We'll be giving a presentation titled Transportation Access and Housing Affordability in Dakota County. This presentation is given to you by me, Fatima Aiden. Adriana Holling and Evelyn Torres on the end. We are a school district 196 youth group formed through Esperanza United. Esperanza United is an organization that specializes in solving issues within underrepresented communities. Our group is made up of high school students that are passionate on inquiring a solution to the issues of transportation and housing affordability for the region's youth. To learn about these topics, we discussed the impacts of these issues on our lives, reviewed statistics on the topics, conducted interviews, and analyzed the data from them to make recommendations for improving metropolitan policies. Our group narrowed down some issues of interest to us, which include the lack of transportation in suburban areas and the housing affor affordability for newer generations. We conducted 20 interviews with young adults ages 14 to 24 in our community. We asked about their personal experiences with finding and accessing transportation living in the suburbs, as well as their or their own family's experiences with finding and accessing affordable housing. From these interviews, we connected the personal experiences from the interviews with data from the region. Collectively, we have put in many hours using Met Council data and connecting it with our own stories. Personally, I have been at the center of unaffordable housing, like Section 8 and other welfare programs. So the research we have done brings, light, brings a lot of light to many, what many families go through and are suffering through on a daily basis. We came to some conclusions and points of interest with connections during our youth group discussions and meetings. Now moving on to Adriana. 
Young adults and teenagers are all at need for access to transportation, yet they're not old enough to provide safe transportation for themselves. The issue of accessible transportation provided in suburban areas has a major effect on these young adults. This is an incredibly important issue to us because we have all had firsthand experience with trouble finding transportation, whether it was to a friend's house or to this presentation. Young adults and teenagers have places they need to be. At early ages before the legal driving age, it's especially hard to find transportation. I'm sure you can remember times when your parents were unable to take you to that one sleepover or that important football game at the high school. When we look at alternative options, we also find various issues. There is a certain busing culture that is present in somewhere in our, that is present here. There are certain budget in our state um, that isn't present in somewhere where public transit is more popular, such as places like New York City. Busing culture is the way people perceive our, re our region's public transit and many consider it unsafe or that it makes them uncomfortable. And these ideas don't just come from nowhere. And on top of that, our region isn't exactly walkable outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul. There's nowhere to walk once you get off the bus. A person I interviewed personally told me that once you get off the bus, there's nowhere to go. Egan is not a walkable city, end quote. Sidewalks are their own way of transportation, whether it's on foot foot or on a bike. They are needed everywhere. But even biking can be difficult to come by during the extreme and harsh winters. Through the interviews and our own personal experiences, there is a common theme about transportation. People rely on transportation because they don't have access to a car or their destination is not within walking distance. Fatima interviewed a female college student about her transportation. She stated, quote, as a college student, transportation is difficult because I have to find a bus that fits my schedule and the bus route schedule, end quote. Especially now that the transportation industry was heavily impacted by COVID-19, a lot of roads were cut due to low ridership. We are still being impacted to this day. A person I interviewed told me after being asked the question about how their experiences or challenges influenced their thoughts on access to transportation in their community, quote, with my age and the social activities going around at my school, it's made me have a higher need for access to transportation, end quote. In other words, many students in school want to participate in school social activities, but it is difficult because they do not have the access to transportation to or from these activities. The last quote came from one of our own group members, Matthew, speaking about his personal experiences of transportation. He stated, quote, I would like to bike more, but the winter is very fierce in the suburbs. Especially, everything is spread out, so biking is not efficient. I would like to take the bus, but there are not as many bus stops. It's not like the subway in New York City, end quote. Others would agree we have harsh winters, and there are not nearly enough sidewalks or bus stops around our neighborhoods. So following this data and the issues we explored, we made some vision statements for our region. For accessible transportation, our communities have safe environments for youth to freely access busing, bike routes, and sidewalks. When we give youth more transportation opportunities, not only do we help benefit their lives, but we benefit our own economy and well-being of the region. Youth contribute a lot more to the region than some may think, from jobs to community service to social activities to even education. Not only is transportation an issue that we have in our region, but it's also housing, um, housing affordability. So the issue is the housing affordability is based off of one's income, and, but it does not include expensive or, utili or utilities. Rent should also be factored in the housing affordability, including facts like wages, prices of items, necessities, utilities, cost of education, and number, a number of family members living in a household. The cost of living increases, but the wages do not. Um, when housing is unaffordable, you have to make the decision to live in a neighborhood that is underprivileged in education. With this issue pointed out, what's the importance? Well, the importance is, is that there's a cycle that puts children through from birth, um, through from birth. They automatically have less education opportunities in their school due to the lack of funding, so, from their surrounding disadvantaged um, neighborhoods. And here are some quotes from our interviews and our um, little with our within our groups. We, are also, we have spoken about experiences and noticed some things about housing in our region. After I interviewed my friends, I've noticed that they plan to move away from home to have their so-called college experience. What I said in one of our meetings, and I quote, some of us want 
want to want so-called college experience, or I am, I'm sorry. Some of us want to move out to want to move out, but this prevents this presents financial challenges. Some people want to move out to have their college experience, but they will accumulate a lot of debt. From my from my observation, my friends weren't paying attention about the price of housing, but instead they focused more about the idea of being independent and away from your parents. They don't think about the long-term effects that they will face later on. Another thing that I've noticed was the price uh, the price of rent raising every year, but the pay rate, the rate of um, the raises at work, does not follow this trend. Through my mom, I've been observing the rent of my house has been increasing give or take $50, but my mom's rage only increases by a few cents. Especially for low income families like my situation, it's difficult for families to maintain their stable living. My mother took care of three kids, feeding them, paying for clothes, their school education, and extremely hard for a single parent. Not to mention my cousin had to live with me during COVID times to up to his senior year because of his unstable living situation. And so the importance of our vision statement, with our research and our meetings and of our vision for the region for housing affordability is to improve lives in stricken communities by div diversify and flourish for, flourish for those in financial need. Allowing people from different backgrounds to have the help for affordable housing, whether by implementing more programs or lowering prices. And if this vision happens, young people such like ourselves will be able to produce education opportunities limited, currently limited due to housing costs. Also, all families would have the housing that, that meets their needs. For my final experience, when I was younger, second to fourth grade, I lived in an apartment complex with my mom and my two siblings, my older brother and younger sister. We only had two rooms. I had to share a room with my mom and my sister. As for my brother, he had his own room. Within our room with my mom and my sister, I had my own bed, but beneath my own bed, there was a pull-up bed for where my mom and my sister would sleep. And it would be hard to imagine now, it might have been easier for us to maintain this living life when we were younger, but if we were to continue being in that apartment complex, it would have not worked. Before we give our recommendations and goals, we would like to express gratitude for this program and everything we got out of this. I enjoyed my firsthand experience with the Met Council interns and learning about the cycle of change that occurs in our region. Evelyn got firsthand experience on what to consider for a region and was able to express her thoughts about what can be done for future cities. And Fatima was able to share her own story with others on her own experience with unaffordable housing. Now moving on to our goals. The first one we have is that more routes go in and out or nearby suburban areas. We would like to see young adults find transportation in their neighborhoods more often. We would also like to see more sidewalks. Like I previously mentioned, there are hardly any sidewalks in Egan. I know in my neighborhood, I've never seen any besides around the elementary school I live by. Sidewalks offer a safe walking and biking route. They're necessary for further transportation. And we hope to see more diverse types of affordable housing built across the region. When I mention diverse housing, I'm talking about multifamily homes, apartments, condos, semi-detached homes, and multi-generational homes, and more. When we implement more diverse and affordable housing, we increase housing accessibility for younger generations who are at a disadvantage with rising housing prices. So to achieve this, we would recommend more bus stops around neighborhoods, more transportation options, including sidewalks, and creating a more accurate definition of what affordable housing is. Thank you, Chair and Council Members. Well, thank you. We have some questions. Council Member Cedarberg. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, you just kind of summarized so much on... I look back when I was your age and where I lived. I grew up in St. Paul, and I had sidewalks. I biked everywhere because it was safe. I biked when I was five. We could go miles. I biked to my job, which was 10 miles away. You know, we didn't have a car, so we could walk or bike or, you know, when you have multiple kids. And the awareness you've just brought to me, when you think about being in Dakota County, 
where you don't have the public. And, and I had bus, because I lived by Snelling Avenue. So if you wanted to go downtown, there was the bus. Or go to Minneapolis, there was the bus. So thank you for bringing this awareness of the issues of how you need to live your lives as young people where there isn't transportation, there's no sidewalks, things are farther apart, it's, it's not as safe as it was when I was a, a young person. Um, so I just really want to thank you for highlighting that and putting a mirror up to how I live my life as a young person. It's pretty easy in comparison to what you're trying to live your life where you are in Dakota County. So I think this is something for the council to really think about and look at and just thank you for really a fantastic presentation and shining a light on, on what you're experiencing. Thank of you. Of course, thank you for listening. I just wanna say thank you. Uh, as a 15 years old father, uh, I just wanna say I hear you. All the issues that you guys have every day, I hear you. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Robert. Yeah, thanks. And I didn't add my thanks to my colleagues as well and to Councilmember Cedarberg's point. And, you know, I grew up in a very rural part of the metro area, of the seven county metro area. And as young people, if we wanted to go anywhere, we had to bike. And the difference was we felt safe where we were biking. And so that I'm really hearing that. And also in your recommendations and just to kind of connect dots from your work and how we hear it and maybe how it impacts the work we're doing right now, as you are all very well aware, and it surprises me, we're establishing our 2050 comprehensive plan design guides. And we had a very interesting and robust discussion in community development committee just this week about the connection between transportation and housing and in the policy realm, and then that informs not just the policy, but where our resources go as well. And Council Member Wolf was very adept at making the point that in areas like you're talking about where there's limited transportation, we need to expand the kind of transportation options we're talking about. And so as you lift up what I would categorize or generalize as active transportation, safe walking, safe biking as alternatives, and, and, and I think this is gonna be a really interesting era of figuring out how these alternative transportations relate to our 2050 design guidelines. So thanks for lifting that up. That's great. Any other questions? All right, well, we have much to ponder and really appreciate your experiences mm -hmm. and your recommendation. Thank you. Good evening, chairs and council members. My name is Damanta Bassnett. I'm from the Whitney Snipley's community. My name is Larissa, and I'm from the Korean community. Oh, my name is Ibrahim. I'm from the Senegalese community. And today we'll be talking about housing affordability, transportation safety, and culture and community. Uh, World Youth Connect uh, is a nonprofit organization. We started in 2021. Uh, we're youth-led. Our CEO is 25 years old. Uh, we're a diverse group of about 50 youth here in St. Paul. Uh, we seek to just go in into our community and try and make everything better for ourselves. Um, we try to magnify the importance of youth involvement in our community. So we uh, have partnerships with other organizations, everything, trying to get youth into leadership positions, um, into job opportunities, volunteering, just to make sure they're in their community. So today we'll be talking about the different issues of housing affordability, transportation safety and community and culture. And we'll also take a look at why these issues are uniquely important to our communities. Then we'll be looking at the values and visions we created, and then we'll give a final reflections and recommendations for the region. So to begin with, um, let's look at affordable housing and safe communities. So we found that the cost of housing is increasing while people still earn the same salary. This has a direct impact on people who are working low income jobs and it's usually people of color and immigrants that are working these jobs. Also, rent isn't the only bill people are paying. People have to pay for so much more things like their basic necessities. Um, some may even have to pay for insurance, loans, 
all of that. And with the cost of housing going up, it creates barriers for families who are already struggling. Also, it is difficult to find affordable housing in these days in general. Oftentimes, when one does manage to find affordable housing, it could often mean it is in a poor living condition or it is in an unsafe area. So the core values relating to these issues are affordability, safety, and sense of community. These issues are important to our community because we're mainly from the underserved community and it affects us directly. Many of our parents are working low-income jobs because of the language barrier and cultural differences, and we're also students paying loans. So it's already hard for us to pay for what's considered the affordable housing as well. So findings. Um, to look at the issue more closely, we interviewed 24 youths age ranging from 13 to 26 in St. Paul. Um, the, the people we interviewed are mostly people of color. So we found out that the people who are struggling with these issues are people of color and immigrants. So um, people in our interview, they talked about their personal experiences surrounding housing, and many of them said that they live in unsafe neighborhoods with higher violence and unsafe living conditions. And like these people, I have similar stories relating to housing. As I lived in an apartment near Rice Street for nearly nine years when I first came to the United States, um, this place was unsafe in terms of the living condition and unsafe in terms of violence. Um, I only lived there because it was more affordable for my family because my mom was the only one providing for my family. So this area where I lived, there would be fights going on every day. Um, people would break in, the doors would be broken all the time. And not only that, but it was unsafe in terms of the living condition because there was moles, mice, rats, roaches, and we all know this has direct impact on our health. Um, so as you can see in the picture there, um, that's the place where I used to live. Um, it is very unsafe. People are breaking in. Um, those are actually homeless people coming in, drawing in the buildings, and people do drugs there too. And that's more examples of affordable housing and what it could look like. And that's also the picture of where I used to live. And um, many people from my community, they still live in these areas only because it is more affordable, affordable for them. So because of the experiences of the people we interviewed and my personal experiences, um, we created vision statements for the region. And this vision um, statement includes that the region makes affordable housing more accessible through increasing minimum wage and decreasing housing cost, or the region's residents who cannot afford housing receive resources to ensure they can pay for housing. Both of these are equally important to us because people do need resources if they want to get out of certain situations. And if we don't do something about this issue, it will continue to grow and people will be unsheltered in the future. And the second issue is about culture and community. The issue is that immigrants and minorities are losing their heritage due to location. I've seen this uh, happen around me a lot. I have experienced this personally when I moved to the US I lived in an apartment with other Korean people, which allowed me to have these interactions and social life with them, and bringing me closer to my own culture. But as we grew up, our needs changed, and we had to move. I noticed that after moving, we were farther from the Korean community, and it was harder to connect as everyone was busy with work and other day-to-day -day life. Things like this caused communities um, to uh, slowly drift away and kids to uh, lose touch with their own culture. Also, when there is no interaction between others, there is no sense of community depending on um, like how when you move from an urban to a suburban area without interacting between neighbors, there is no safety or bonding. And these are the core values that relate to the topic. The first one is unity. When the community comes together feeling safe, that can also be of help to the council because communities can create land use that builds connection and encourage unity among residents. For culture, it's only possible to keep a culture when there is something bringing people together like event planning, culture events, and other like culture buildings. When you do events outside and around parks, it's more welcoming for others to come in freely and not feeling any pressure like they don't belong. The importance of these values is that a community gathering is necessary as when they come together and make connection between each other. 
when you look at it, we need social interaction to be able to communicate between others. And without social interaction within culture, people slowly start drifting away from their own heritage. And that is harder to keep a heritage going as new generations are less exposed to their own cultures. Our interview shows that youths want their community to bond and feel safe around each other. Bonding between communities often helps build trust amongst one another. Bonding can also look as simple as helping each other. During the winter, when one of my neighbor's car got stuck, <coughs> me and a couple other neighbors came together and helped push the car out. This helped us build that connection that day, and later on after, when I needed help, my neighbors came and helped me show a sense of community. Also, a quote that stuck to me, they said, culture is deleted once you get into some type of community. There is a lack of that identity, kids stop being and practicing their own culture. I personally have experienced that when I've seen the kids who grew up in uh, the US, they are integrating with more of their surroundings than their own culture. I want to advance your slides. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, I'm so we sorry. can follow. We following. have them online. So we're following. I'm but, so sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Uh, okay. So for the vision statement, so we created a vision for the region while keeping the interview finding in mind. Our vision statement stated that the region has a population that feels connected, unified, and has trust between each other. Because without a trust or bond inside that community, there will be a gap in the community relationship. All right. Uh, All right. Here we go. Uh, for the final issue, we uh, cover the issue of transportation safety. So public transportation, for the most part, has been not been a safe mode of transportation in the metropolitan area. Uh, improving uh, transit safety is crucial to creating a safe environment for riders and community members, as well as increasing the use of public transportation. As well with that, sidewalks are hard to walk on due to um, bad maintenance, especially during the winter when they're not like shoveled enough, uh, especially in my area where I'm at in, uh, in St. Paul, the, shovel, the sidewalks are almost never shoveled. So when I have to walk to like, uh, when I used to walk to, to go take the bus to school, it was always a struggle. Um, as well, we need different choices in transportation to give people options and to not limit them to one form of transportation as well. Um, how these issues connect to our values. So safety, we want people to have the ability to make, to use public transit without feeling unsafe or in danger. Uh, for accessibility, it's making sure all modes of transportation are, are safe for everybody and for all groups of people, as well as choices, giving people the choices on how to transport themselves from place to place um, and not making areas or situations where they might be forced to use a certain form of transportation. Uh, why these values are important to us, transit safety is necessary to encourage the use of public transportation. It's better for the environment, it's better for uh, road and safety uh, and traffic and everything like that. And uh, making transportation accessible to more people gives, uh, gives more transportation um, options to people who are in marginalized groups. So people who might not have the money to, uh, to have a car or something like that, or people with special needs who need uh, some quarters town of uh, special transportation. Uh, our findings, uh, over half of our interviewees had a violent experience on public transportation. Um, there was a 50, uh, not there was, uh, in 2023, Metro Transit reported that there was a 54% increase in crime on public transit, as well as a 28% increase on it reported assaults and a 182% increase in narcotics use on the Metro Transit system. For us, that was unacceptable for, um, for especially our demographic who needs to use public transportation. Um, for our personal experience, in my experience, um, I was with my uncle when he got robbed on the, on the light rail. So for me, that completely turned me off from ever wanting to use public transportation ever again. So even now, being like a student on, um, on campus now, I have to be like, a, I walk everywhere instead of taking public transportation because just that fear of, wanting, of not wanting to, to be like robbed or assaulted or anything like that, it makes me not want to use public transportation at all. Um, one quote that we had uh, from our, uh, our interviews was that policy should focus on creating a more accessible transit network, especially in suburbs, uh, as it might make it easier for people to travel to, up from those areas. So especially being someone who's from the Senegalese community, we live mostly in the area of like Brooklyn Park. So um, there is buses and everything over there, but that's not like, you can't get into the city really with that. Um, most of the time people have to have cars, they have to order Ubers and Lyfts and taxis and everything. And, I mean, as you know, it, that's very expensive now. Um, our vision statement is that the region has safe multimodal transportation options, uh, safe crosswalks, safe sidewalks for pedestrians and for roads. 
Uh, the importance of this is that people rejecting one form of transportation puts safety, due to safety, puts stress on other forms of transportation like highways, like taxis, like Ubers, everything like that. Now moving on to the recommendations we have for the region. Um, we, for housing affordability, we recommend a development guide that take, takes care of needs of underserved communities and not just the privileged communities. Also, um, this can be done by decreasing the housing cost or increasing the minimum wage and also um, changing the definition of what's called the affordable housing. Currently, the definition of affordable housing includes one third of a person's salary. And if we think about this, this is not realistic. People have to pay for so many more things than just the, co um, the housing costs. So we need to make a plan that's reliable for everyone. And the recommendation for culture and community is that we want to see culturally significant community meeting spaces that are able to bring people together we also want events and programs that unites the community and makes people fit safe together. And for transportation safety, uh, we recommend a safer transit system uh, that addresses the issues of violence and crime. We also want our streets and roads to be pedestrian safe by implementing more safety precautions for pedestrians. Uh, our reflections for this, uh, this experience gave us an opportunity to reflect on our own experiences living in St. Paul uh, and make our voices heard. Throughout the project, we were able to witness the experiences of many people in the community, as well as change, the change and see how change is necessary in many of these areas. Additionally, we learned about the process of research through our interview process. Uh, thank you, Chair and Council members. We're open for questions now. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Carter. Thank you very, very much for your presentation and for the recommendations and reflections in it. I'm particularly impressed that you were able to make the connection as you did between safety and security and culture and belonging and the manner in which uh, the ability to maintain that cultural connection can make a very, very big difference, not only for individuals of a particular culture, but for all of us as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, to just thank you for those things, but also to ask you in the transportation arena, in particular, if there were comments um, or recommendations from your interviews or the, the observations that you called out that could characterize what would make people feel safer in the transit system. Uh, you know, I know that the lack of certain things, i.e., you know, violence or fights or uh, disruptions would help. We have an issue right now with people avoiding transit. And of course, a part of what makes us feel safe are people using transit who use it um, in a way that helps us all feel better there. Were there other things that you heard from the participants that could make them so feel safe other than things not happening? Right, so on the surface level, um, one thing that I did hear in all my interviews was that people want there to be like, like more not particularly policing, but a form of community policing, where it's members of the community who are in the transportation zones, like at bus stops, light rail stops, and stuff like that. Like they're just monitoring the community, just seeing, like making sure everybody's okay, and as well as being on the trains themselves. But one thing that was the underlying thing was that, and this was one, um, one quote for someone, was that we need to address the issues that are causing people to have these kinds of behaviors mm -hmm. uh, on public transit. Okay. So whether it's like narcotics use, violence, or mm -hmm. anything like that, what is like, what are the issues that people are having like outside of transit that are making so that they're behaving that way on public transportation? So for them, that was the most important thing for, for us. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Councilmember Vento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we'll probably be glad that this Maybe you didn't know this before you started, but this is all taped. And so this is recorded. And I, I would ask you to think about people who have influenced, and this is to everyone that presented, presented tonight, think about people who have influenced your lives and helped you to get 
to where you're at in life, whether it's a parent, a grandparent, a friend, um, an organizational leader, a teacher, whoever it was in your life that's helped impact um, your direction, and show them the, the video of this, because these presentations have been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And as a former teacher, I know that I would be blown away to have a former student reach out to me and say, hey, look what I did tonight. Mm -hmm. This has been just tremendous. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Councilor Lee. Yeah, thanks, sir. Um, in the very first uh, group of presentations, the, you, when you framed this whole presentation, you, you, one of the things you talked about was uh, stories and, and quantitative data. And, and mm -hmm. I appreciate how you wove qualitative data or stories throughout all presentations. Mm -hmm. And you shared with us a lot of uh, deeply personal and, and verb, uh, vulnerable information about your own lives with us, um, something that we don't often do with each other up here. And so it's been a, a really uh, important humanizing of the issues that, that we often debate about at the policy level. So thank you for, for, for having the, um, the time and the passion and the eloquence to, to do that uh, with us today. Mr. Shin, thanks. Just briefly, I just can't stop myself. I'm just so impressed with all of this work. I just want to comment. And just this lifting up again of the importance of community and of feeling safe in your community, but feeling connection to your community. And I'm just sort of uh, thinking back over my own journey. And in the early 1980s, I moved to the Phillips area in Minneapolis, not unlike the areas that you're describing that you lived in at the time. And, and I remember the sense of community and the sense of safety were developed through some significant public sector investment. And we had what was called uh, the NRP, Neighborhood Revitalization Program, that pumped taxpayer dollars to community priorities. We had what was called the Community Crime Prevention Safe Program that taught us to organize and make our communities safer. And as we talk, especially about transit safety on this body, we've talked about uh, transit vehicles being sort of the new public realm, right? The public square, that's where people come together. And, and what are the opportunities for us to help build community, which would then result in a safer mm -hmm. uh, transit system? And so it just, it's just something to think about, I think, for us. Councilmember Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Robert's channeling me, because this is, I, I have for so long, I think transit is a community, you know, and right now our community is in a bit of distress, and so we're trying to figure that out. But um, just one of the things I was thinking during the cultural presentation, one of the things I've talked about for years is almost mobility hubs in these centers that where people, you can use these places to connect with people, but those places have to connect the communities. And so they're places where you could, in my mind, where you would have either these different neighborhoods and cultures represented where you can have the outdoor gatherings, but yet you can still use it as functional spaces to get to places. And so, you know, this is very nice because it also kind of re-motivates me to focus back on that. That's all we have for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'll, I'll be Sorry. concluding this presentation. <laughs> there we go. All right. Chair, council members, good afternoon. I'm Sergio Almeida. I'm an intern at the Met Council. In addition to being your timekeeper for this evening, I'm concluding our presentation series by reviewing what we learned from the youth, the young leaders, analysis, and research. I will identify six key themes and how they connect to the Council's cross-cutting regional issues as identified by the Regional Development Guide vision and value process. We will also share some next steps that the Community Development Project sponsors have committed to in order to keep us all accountable to the advice of the young leaders who participated in this project. We want to briefly connect the topics young leaders discussed tonight with the vision and values process for the 2050 Regional Development Guide. Briefly, here are the six central issues discussed by young leaders. Let's walk through how each connects to the cross-cutting regional issues identified for the 2050 Regional Development Guide. As a reminder, the four cross-cutting regional issues are equity, climate, public health, safety, and well-being, and <coughs> natural systems. Affordability relates to the cross-cutting issue of equity, public health, safety, and well-being. Transportation infrastructure was mentioned by several groups this evening. This issue is connected with equity, safety, and public health. Community connection is a unique contribution of this project. 
Youth describe the need for social infrastructure to create connections and communities. This is a dimension of public health and well-being. Parks are essential to the region. This topic is connected to all cross-cutting issues, including natural systems, climate, equity, public health, safety, and well-being. Land and habitat conservation include farmland and habitat conservation. As we heard, it connects to all the regional cross-cutting issues. In workshops, young leaders talked about water quality. Water recreation and water quality are important to them and relate to all cross-cutting issues. To conclude, the issues raised by young leaders provide unique perspectives about important issues we face as a region. Now we'll highlight the next steps. First is to re report back, and that is through a series of memos that details the youth leader collaboration engagement findings, and to connect those with the council's vision and values work. The results will be widely shared to create accountability. Second is to establish the continuity, and this is done through the strategic and early sharing, um, and sharing often. Uh, we'll be sharing the process, the strengths and learnings incorporated into future engagements. And third is to showcase the regional developing guides uh, or how the regional development guide will incorporate the information. And we'll do that through quotes and perspectives included in the regional development guide context and through online storytelling. And lastly, we want to thank you for your undivided attention. And now we want to invite any questions and comments. We'll have about five minutes for questions uh, and comments. And then lastly, we would like to ask, how would you like the results of the Young Leaders Collaboration incorporated into the Regional Development Guide? Thank you, excellent. We have five minutes, and what a wonderful timekeeper you've been, in addition to everything oh, else here. Yeah. We have five minutes for questions, anybody? Mm. We, you know, I'll just jump in. I, I will just echo a lot of the comments you've already heard. Um, remarkable presentations mm -hmm. on the issues that we discuss on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but to give real life examples and for us to kind of see that world mm -hmm. through your eyes uh, really is inspiring and I think will be very practically uh, applicable to the work we're doing with these development guides. and. Um, I think, uh, you know, this might be things we reflect on and staff will as well as we develop uh, over the next year, this year, um, a, lot of this, a lot of this work. You know, it's one thing to say, and I think, uh, Councilman Lilligan, you said it best, we, we had these great debates on community development, uh, but in many times, uh, their ideas, their policies, to actually see what effect they might have to give us a little bit more than just stories, but to know that uh, what we're working toward uh, gives us both, uh, as I mentioned, something practical, but also real hope uh, and hope for the future because what we heard today is not just uh, good information, but your aspirations and your insistence on, uh, on a standard for the future, which are the values we embrace here and know that uh, I feel better about uh, the next generation and the future because uh, you're gonna be here leading that way. Councilmember Carter. Thank you again. And for the concluding package that helps us to reflect on and ensure accountability back to the work that has been done and that the learnings are reflected through that throughout. I think that's very important. I would ask a question not necessarily for a response right now, but it seems as though the process that you all have gone through has been engaging. It looks as though it's been one in which you've truly felt a sense of belonging and connectivity and have built some trust together. And it seems to be a microcosm for us to reflect on and build forward from. So in addition to the recommendations that are coming to us today in this presentation. I would wonder if there is an opportunity to reflect on what you learned, what was great about the process that you've been about, um, you know, going through recently, 
the manner in which you were engaged, the manner in which you were able to engage others, and what you would reflect forward should happen in the process that will be continuing in order to bring folks in in a way that does build that trust, that does create the connectivity and the opportunity for belonging and, and welcoming and genuine contribution. I was able to glean, you know, I think, some significant things that we should call moving forward. But if there's any set of, um, you know, any list of those characteristics or ways of being, things that worked, also perhaps, although I believe it has been a great process, things that were needed or could be incorporated as we move forward. I'd love, and I think other council members may as well, the opportunity to hear that. Thank you, council member. Uh, we have incorporated a, a feedback system, a reflection uh, activity in these final workshops to capture all that information and to preserve it for future collaboration. So all that was duly noted and, and we're working on that as well. Great. Council member Lee. Thank you. Um, when, when people think of the Met Council, they often just think about the buses and trains. And I think what we just had here is that you, we, you've been the, the better ambassadors in, in, in telling the story of, of all the work that we do. And this is not a critique of, of our staff or ourselves, but we do have to do a better job branding ourselves in, 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 in the community because clearly uh, you've done a really great job telling how our work, at our policy uh, intersects with affordable housing and, and workforce development. And so the, the, that was a very powerful thing to, to remind us. Thank you, Council Member. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay. And uh, I just want to add my thanks to this whole group. I mean, this is just amazing. And you used the word, Mr. Chair. It just gives you hope, right, about the future. This is your region. Really, we're just sort of, we're, we're, we're old, or at least I'm old. So, uh, so thanks for that. And so the question of how this could be used in the, 20, the development or the 2050 development guidelines. And one of the things I was really impressed with, let me back up. One of the things we really struggle with here is how to uh, create policy to support equity and even to define equity. I mean, we talk, we have debates about it all the time. And I really was impressed with the breadth and the scope of the equity issues you addressed. There was geographic equity, there was ability equity, income equity, racial equity issues that were um, expressed in this work. And, and as we're struggling now just to put some broad principles together, not struggling, we're working you know, robustly toward putting principles together uh, for the 2050 design guidelines and this idea of equity and how is that going to permeate all of the work that we do. And I think you've given us some really good tools and some really good thinking here of how we can incorporate that broadly across our, our values and our design guidelines. So thank you. Yeah. It's more uh, not necessarily a question, more of an observation is if you really look around the room here, this is probably the most diverse council uh, that's ever been here and, and called the call to order. And looking on the on, at the youth here today, that's the most, most diverse group we've had before us mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. So it not only provides hope, uh, but uh, you've interjected culture into what the presentation is, your own experience. Some of our experiences probably could be very, very similar. Um, but so I think it's, it does provide hope. Um, mm -hmm. But you can also take a look around the room and take a look at the, the people here. And if it, you can also hold us accountable. Mm -hmm. And down the line, as you see what you're working on today, and if you, it comes back to you so in another venue, uh, remember that you can always come back here and, and look at... Uh, Ask one of us if there's something there that, that uh, it ties it all together. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Carter. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for your tenacity, for your hard work, and for being authentic. You know, it, it's hard when you're uh, uh, tackling problems and, and, you, and you're thinking about your future and trying to move up. Um, what are you letting go? But you guys have not let go of your communities and I can see that you're gonna be champions for your community. And I say thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments, questions? Council Member Vento. 
Very quickly, Mr. Chair, I just want to do a shout out to all of the staff who are a part of mm -hmm. putting this together, led by, by Darcy, of course, but th th it, it took a village and that the village was there and just did a great job. So to each of the staff members who have been a part of this, thank you. Well, with that, this bus is uh, on time and on budget, and it's 6 o'clock. Um, thank you all in the room who participated in this process. Uh, and um, uh, honestly, this is the beginning, not the end, and we look forward to more interactions in the future. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>